Welcome to this week's episode of Brainstorm, where we give you a glimpse into the world of science for Wednesday, April 3rd, 2013. Our top story is from the world of medicine. Some people over at Harvard's Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering have been developing and will continue to develop an artificial spleen. You may remember the Wies Institute from when we covered their organ-on-a-chip technology. Those were structures that contained actual human cells and replicated the physical environments of organs on a small scale. That technology was meant for better drug testing. Although somewhat similar in concept, this artificial spleen is different in some key ways. Unlike their organ chip technology, it doesn't contain human or any other kind of cell, and the replication of the organ's function is actually being developed for direct medical use. The spleen is probably a pretty underrated organ, maybe owing to the fact that it can be removed without a person dying. But it does have a number of immune system-related functions that have inspired its artificial counterpart. It works with the help of magnetic nanobeads that would be injected into someone with a serious infection in the bloodstream. These beads are coated in a modified version of a human protein that binds to a wide variety of bacteria, viruses, parasites, and other nasty things. A patient's blood is then filtered through microchannels in the artificial spleen, where magnetic forces pull out the bead-coated pathogens, leaving behind all the normal human blood cells and other components. The microchannels are even made from a superhydrophobic material that the Wies Institute also developed to prevent blood clotting. Now the technology is still in development, but the next step is testing in large animal models, with the eventual goal of rapidly filtering the blood to treat infections and even counteract sepsis, both for normal patients and soldiers in the battlefield. No real segue, just shoehorning in another reminder to check out information for the upcoming charity livestream to fight HIV. It's this weekend, and we're doing our podcast thing live as a part of it. Sorry in advance. Next is an update from the world of genetics, a massive collaboration between the University of Copenhagen and many other researchers from around the world have successfully mapped the enzyme telomerase. Analyzing the gene that codes for it and many variations of it within the human population, plus how these variations affect a cell. We've talked about telomerase on Brainstorm before in relation to anti-aging research. Telomeres are the protective portions on the ends of chromosomes, and each round of cell division makes telomeres shorter. Eventually, the telomeres disappear and the chromosomes rapidly degrade, essentially killing the cell. However, certain cells are kind of immortal by using the telomerase enzyme to restore the length of their protective telomeres. These are your sperm, eggs, stem cells, and unfortunately, cancer. Hence, the goal of this project being the investigation of cancer's association with variants in telomerase. Although a link between telomere length and cancer risk was definitely demonstrated through this analysis, the results were slightly more complex. Different variations were associated with increased risk of certain types of cancers, while others determined the length of telomeres, so more research is needed. Ultimately, though, This is an important step toward further understanding what increases cancer risk and hopefully even how to detect and prevent it. Lastly, we have a quick story from the world of biology. Here on Brainstorm, we talk a lot about technology and advancements that could help the environment. But there are also simpler ways to improve things, such as planting trees. Not only do trees absorb and store carbon dioxide through their growth, but they help reduce greenhouse gases in other ways. Researchers from the University of Michigan analyze the effect reforestation has on the amount of carbon stored in soil. Somewhat surprisingly, it seems to be even more carbon than the actual trees themselves. The main mechanism behind this is the growth and decay of roots, other plants, and associated fungi. For example, Planting or allowing trees to grow naturally on land previously used for surface mining or other industrial activities doubled the soil carbon content after 20 years. A little less exciting are the results of planting on former agricultural or former grasslands. Planting trees on agricultural land can increase the soil carbon by an average of 15% after about 40 years. And a similar amount of time is necessary for increased carbon by up to 30% for former grassland soil. 
Although long-term, these results are still quite significant and offer yet another approach for reducing atmospheric CO2 and counteracting climate change. Well, hope you enjoyed this episode. In reference to our first story, what biologically inspired technology would you like to create? Let us know your thoughts on that and all the stories in the comments.